Is there anybody who did not get a chance to watch the video? Okay. Yes, yeah, I saw it. So if you didn't get to see the video, the video was- uh, No, I saw it. I thought you asked if, who did get to see it. I'm oh, sorry. who did get to see it. Okay. You, so, I, I did. I did. You did. Okay. I did not. You did not. Okay. So the video was a uh, basically about 40 minutes long with Rabbi Sherry Hirsch of AGU um, discussing two different women's um, thoughts on Haredi Judaism. One is a, is a woman who went off, uh, left Haredi Judaism and is an expert um, in that regard. And another is a woman who wrote a book and is uh, called uh, Silver Screen, Silver, I ordered it and it hasn't come yet. Silver Screen in the Hasidim or something like that. Um, and it was an interesting conversation, but I don't think that for our purposes, you have to, ha you have to have seen right. um, the, the discussion that they had. There were a couple parts that stuck out to me and I will just highlight them. The first is uh, they obviously were discussing why is it that we care so much about the Haridim? And they talked about this concept called off the derech, off mm -hmm. the derech. So the derech is the path, right? The right. path that you're supposed to be on if you're an Orthodox Jew, or especially if you're a, Har a Haredi or a Hasidic Jew. And one of the complicating things of the co of this conversation is that if you are not deeply immersed in the world of the Haredim, it all is one big blur, or it can appear as one big blur. Mm -hmm. Whereas, in fact, um, there are many distinctions between between the groups. And so, before I share my thoughts on why the obsession with Haredim. I just want to give you a little bit of information that I uh, learned about the Haredim in Israel. I'm not, I'm not going to speak about Haredim in this country because this was all from the Jerusalem Post in 2020. And from 2020 to 2022, there was a series over time about Haredim in the Jerusalem Post. And, um, and it covered all kinds of different aspects of their community. And I just wanted to share with you that in Jerusalem, 33% of the residents of Jerusalem are considered mm -hmm. Haredim. That is a radical difference between the way it was 30 years ago. It's the, the percentage of Haredim in Jerusalem is really large. The, the thing is, though, that Haredim encompasses a lot of different groups. There are people who refer to themselves and other people refer to them as the Litvox. Those are the people who are the Lith from the Lithuanian yeshiva world. Very, very, very um, religious, and they are the ones who put Torah study at the absolute highest value. They're the ones, if you've ever heard of kolels, where men who are full grown men don't get jobs and they simply study, their job is uh, to study. Those are, those are primarily the people who um, are the lit box. Then you have people who are classified as Hasidim. Then you have um, the Sephardi Haredim that kind of do their own thing. You have people who call themselves the new Haredim. Those are people who are Baalei Tshuva, who don't necessarily fit into any of the other groups. There are uh, the Eda Haredit and then the Torah Karta. The Torah Karta are the ones who are the anti-Zionists. Um, there, um, and then within the Hasidim, I actually, I had to, I printed it out. There was, <laughs> I have something that lists the eight factions. Oh, and I, of course, 
the people who call themselves simply ultra orthodox. But hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh, here it is. It was right in front of me. There are, I, I'm just going to read this one because I, this is more than I knew before I read this. Okay. In Jerusalem, there are eight dynasties in the Hasidic Haredi world. The Gur Hasidim are the largest group in Jerusalem with 110,000 members across the country. Bells is the second largest with 50,000. A community called the Vishnitz living in B'nai Barak. There mm -hmm. are the breast lovers who speak Yiddish. Mm -hmm. And there are, there is Chabad, of course. Then there are uh, the Slonim Alexander Boyan Carlin. That's a uh, four different minor versions of the same sect. Um, who all uh, went a different way after their um, their leader died, the Toldot Aharon dynasty, and then a Daharedit, which I already mentioned, is actually one of the Hasidic groups. So there are all these little groups that when you and I watch a show like Shtisel, okay, how many of you have seen Shtisel? Only, only a couple of you have watched this. Okay, um, oh. have, you you watched it. Okay, so it when when those of us who are not in that world watch one of these shows that have these Haredi people <laughs> in them, we might not know what group um, they they are from, but the people that are in that world can tell by where the hat is placed on the head, mm -hmm. by whether or not uh, they are wearing long socks, short socks, white socks, black socks, by the kind of belt that the men are wearing, um, by the length of the jackets that they're wearing. All, they have all kinds of ways that they can tell just by looking, um, whether or not they place the their peyote, the men, in front of their ears or behind their ears, I, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, For well, those I, of us who are not in that world, it all uh, seems the same, but they are very different from one another. Some of them are more accepting of modernity and, than others. Some of these Haredim are um, actually Zionists, they speak Hebrew. They are um, just very, very religious Israelis. And some of them are anti-Zionists who side with um, Israel's enemies over and over because of the fact that they believe that Israel um, shouldn't be under the control of the Jews until the Mashiach comes. Right. Um, and That's therefore, the Yes, the Satmar and the Naturi Karta, and uh, and um, some of those don't even let let their children don't even want their children to learn Hebrew, Hebrew, even though they're living in Israel, which makes it very difficult to function if you don't know um, Hebrew. So those are um, some of the sub groups. Tonight we're supposed. Now that we're kind of all on the same, we know who it is that we're talking about. The question, which is not really 100% answered in the, in the video from mm -hmm. AJU is the question, why the obsession? And so I have a million theories and my theories are equally as valid as your theories because they're just theories. I, I don't, I have no proof for them. I don't know how to test them. So before I share my theories, I am curious um, if any of you watched Stissel or if any of you watched Unorthodox mm -hmm. or, um, or My Unorthodox Life or any of the various versions of, of um, movies or television shows 
about the ultra orthodox or Haredi world, whether it's supposed to be a reality show or um, some fictionalized version of, of a story, why did why are you personally drawn to it? And mm -hmm. let's see if we can extrapolate based on our own personal um, thoughts, and then we'll go from there. I don't want to give you the answer right away. I got to hear what you say. <laughs> I thought you said there was no answer. It was just theories. Well, I, well, I that's what I mean. I, I want to oh, hear. Okay. I want to hear what your theories and thoughts are. Go ahead, Maxine. Well, I'm. I, I was going to say I'm really not drawn to them, but I I was kind of drawn to the only thing I've seen is is unorthodox, mm -hmm. and I think that what drew me to that is it's it's a different way of life, a way of life that's so different from mine. Oh, and I yeah. and I was curious as to um, the the woman in it, you know, what her life was like and why she left that life. But I think that. In general, I kind of have a, my theory of why we see the ultra orthodox more depicted more in, uh, in the media, not in media, but in TV, movies, et cetera, et cetera, is that they are, um, there's such an extreme that they stand out. Mm -hmm. Okay. You and I do not stand out. We just don't. We're just, okay. You know, sorry, but we're just you know your your ordinary people that happen to be Jewish, and they are they're they're just so different from mm -hmm. uh, main. I can't even call it mainstream, but the people that we're normally exposed to. So I, I think that might be what attracts a film and TV to them. Okay, mm -hmm. so, so so that encompasses a couple of things. One is the extremism of their religious ideology, but also the distinctiveness of their dress. Yes. Their lifestyle. They are the Jewish version of the Amish, right? Mm -hmm. Every American knows how obsessed Americans are with the Amish, right? Mm -hmm. We love the Amish. We love reading movie or, or reading books about them, watching yeah. movies about them. Um, going and visiting them in Sarasota or in, uh, I don't know, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania. Uh, Pennsylvania. or in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. Um, and and um, part of the reason for that is because their lives in some ways are so very ours that, that the extremism is very fascinating. So excellent theory. Uh, go ahead, Shavy and then Jane. Um, sort of to continue on a Maxine is that they're like a mystery. They seem mm -hmm. to like stick to themselves and we don't know very much about them. Um, they don't want to associate with the other Jews in Israel. They want to stick to themselves, have their own like network. And so it's the mystery, the unknown of them. I think that causes some attraction as well. Okay. So I think that's an excellent answer as well. Jane? Well, also building on that, because I think what Maxine and Shavy said are the way I my, I think part of my fascination, but the other thing is, I feel that they are Jewish and I am Jewish, but they're a part of my family or my Jewishness that is mysterious to me. Um, and I, I don't know if some of it is the way my great, great grandparents might have lived, um, but it's certainly uh, things that are, are so foreign to me, but yet, they're my people too. So that's why I'm curious. Okay. So, <laughs> so, so that's the, the cut. I see your hands up here, don't worry. Yeah, um, okay. That's the concept that, that um, they are, are they a window? We are, we are interested in them because they may be a window into how subconsciously we might be wondering if that's how Jews are supposed to live. Right, if that's how Jews have always lived or how we're supposed to live. That's one of the things that I think um, is encompassed by what you're saying, Jane, that if, if is that how my grandmother lived? I, I know the, uh, my answer to that is, is most definitely not the way right. my grandparents right. lived. And um, by, by no stretch of the imagination did I have any relatives like that in my family. But um, 
it is different than than the way that I live. Um, go ahead, Sapir. Sapir. Well, I, I came in late, unfortunately, a little bit, so I missed some of what um, Maxine said. I don't know if I might be repeating, but you know, in, in some ways, maybe it's kind of how people look when they pass by a really bad car accident. Like they have to see, they, ha they just wanna see something different and that they haven't seen. And then, you know, because the, the Haredi world is kind of so closed, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think people feel like it's almost a lurid attraction to see what's really going on there. You know, they, you know, yeah, I mean the mystery of it in that sense, but it's kind of like this, this like a, a bystander, like a, a rubbernecking kind of a thing, you know, um, I mean, I've had people and they think I'm religious, you know, they're like, oh, you're the most religious person I know. And like, they're so wrong. But the point being that they, they have no contact with, you know, Jews that know anything, let's say about Judaism. And they're like, oh, do they really have sex with sheets and stuff, holes in their sheets? And it's like, because people, I don't know, they just don't know. And they feel like, oh, they're getting an insider view. Excellent, excellent point. You can put your hand down now. I, I, I don't have the power to put your hand down. Cool. I'm not a host, so I can't do that, but you can click on it. Go ahead, Thank Mindy, you. and then Mindy, and then um, somebody else had their hand. Oh, and then Barbara. Go ahead, Mindy. Okay, so my, my curiosity actually has been answered by all the things that all of you have said, but I would like to layer on top of that, that um, in Israel, the Orthodox contingency seems to have quite a grip um, in the political process. Mm -hmm. And in turn, that also affects diaspora is Jewish diaspora um, and is Jewish Israeli relations. So there is that fascination also of wanting to see inside that whatever community, however it's presented on the screen, um, to, to understand it a little bit more. Because yes, Jane, like it, it is my people, and yet there's there's kind of a curtain you know, but between how um, we live and how they live. Um, and if only to understand how maybe Israel politics work a little better or how it affects um, diaspora Jews with, with Israel, that's, that's an additional reason why I'm, I'm curious about it. Mm -hmm. I think that's an, that's an excellent point, Mindy, because the Haredi population is simply outpacing the non-Haredi population. Yeah. When the av now, the average size of a family um, in Israel is is much larger than the average size of a family in America. But that's partially yeah. due to the fact that the very religious often have anywhere between uh, eight and Ten twelve kids. children. Right, they they can have easily eight. Eight is very common, mm -hmm. and they're doing it in very small spaces. Right, we, you know we complain if if somebody, right? We, we talked a lot of, uh, over the last couple of years about uh, personal space and and all of that. There were a lot of Jews in Israel, a lot of Haredim who couldn't couldn't get away from their families. They were, you know, ten people in a three bedroom. Uh, um, apartment is very difficult to get away from anybody. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, absolutely. And I will just add one thing, Mindy, I'm trying not to editorialize, mm -hmm. but it's not just that they have a grip on the power in Israel. Um, it's that their grip on, on power in Israel is combined with the fact that they view you and mm -hmm. me as goyim, and I'm using the word that they use. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. can, they call us goyim. They don't think of us as Jews. If if they think of us as Jews, they think of us as Jews who are going to burn in hell. Because mm -hmm. by the way, though we say that Jews don't go to hell, they'll say that Jews do believe in hell, and we're going there. Okay, and we'll um, see you there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So all of us will be together, but it'll sort of be. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so that is an added complication because as American Jews, especially conservative Jews in particular in the United States, most communal organizations are staffed by conservative Jews, mm -hmm. conservative um, movement Jews, whether that's in federation 
or in day schools or in Hillel's um, that is disproportionately staffed by conservative Jews, whether they're rabbis or late or, or um, non-rabbis. Educators. And um, educators. And so it is um, very complicated when, when huge swaths of the Israeli uh, Jewish population views us as not, uh, not Jewish. So that's a complicating factor when we are, we're, we might be committed to Kalal Yisrael and we try and include everybody in our well wishes. It's not reciprocated necessarily. Um, mm -hmm. I know that Sid, Sid uh, was kind enough to send me Rabbi Plotkin's um, blog, uh, latest blog. I don't know if it's, what does he call that, Sid? Is that his blog? No, just a, just a, newsletter his newsletter and his latest newsletter was about the Haredi mm -hmm. team and yeah. how they um, are not kind i'm just going to say not kind not kind to the non Haredi and mm -hmm. that he, he himself has had a few issues um this summer vis-a-vis uh, -vis his um supervising of of Ben's boat you know in in New York and mm -hmm. that his kashrut supervision is suspect by virtue of the fact that he's not um, orthodox yeah. and certainly not ultra orthodox or Haredi. And mm -hmm. so um, it, it really does impact uh, our relationship. Okay, Barbara, what were you gonna say? Well, I find it rather interesting um, that a couple of you commented that um, maybe uh, we wonder whether our Great grandparents, grandparents, great grandparents lived this kind of uh, Haredi life. Um, I would never have thought about that. Um, I uh, was very fortunate. I'm well in my 80s, and I was very fortunate to have known all four grandparents and lived with two of them from age uh, five to nine. Um, would they that that set of grandparents? Uh, one was from Budapest and the other was from somewhere in Czechoslovakia. And um, uh, that grandfather was a Kohen and went to shul every Shabbos. And uh, I used to go with him um, because there were no boys around. I was the girl who went um, mm -hmm. at any rate. And they had three daughters. So, um, and my grandmother from Budapest, we used to say to her, grandma, talk to us a little bit in Hungarian. Absolutely not. She would only speak. She would only speak Hungarian to her siblings on the telephone. Whenever they were together as as a, a family or visiting, it was always English. We are Americans. This is how we. This is how we live. So um, I find that rather curious to even think about. I would never think about whether even their parents lived this kind of heredity life. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay. Uh, Shavy and then Sapir. So we talk about the Haredi community being close together. The only um, name that comes to mind that's sort of come out of the community, Naomi Reagan is a Haredi Jew, and she writes all her books about Haredi Judaism, you know, but she is an insider who is telling the story. So I find that really interesting because as you've said, they tend to stick together and not let anybody in, but she's on the inside, letting everybody from the outside in to what their world is like, including not so nice things like, you know, divorce and abuse and stuff like that. So, you know, I, I find her, that's why maybe why I like reading her books, because I find them gives us a little insight into the Haredi community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent point. Um, so Pierre, go ahead. I mean, I, I don't even know. I'm, it's not clear to me when the term Haredi actually came into existence. And if you want to say like, OK, so my grandparents um, came here between World Wars One and Two. They were in their teens. So um, I, I know that my grandmother's father was a rabbi. Um, and I believe he was a Kohen. Um, but anyway, then he was in the Tsar's army. Um, 
but and I have a picture of him in his uniform. So, you know, I don't know what kind of life. I mean, my grandmother would never talk about the kind of life, whatever was going on in Poland. She, as close as we were, and she died when I was 17, but she had 17 years where she could have said something to me about her life back in Poland. And they never even mentioned it. And my grandfather certainly would have never talked about it. Um, my other grandfather, I wasn't that close. And my other grandmother was born in Boston. So I don't know what went on, but I mean, whatever kind of life they lived, back in let's say the 1800s or even the beginning of the 1900s, was that considered Haredi? I don't, did they have that term back then or that was just how Orthodox Jews lived? Well, there were, there were the dynasties, there were Hasidic Jews and there were Litvaks already at that point in, in history. So yes, there were those groups. The difference is, is that the, and I would say the insularity is newer. The antagonism between um, between them and uh, actually not. That's I was going to say something that I'm going to correct before I even say it. The boldness that they feel in certain places and the comfort that they feel in confidence to attack the non haredi is definitely new in 10 to 20 years and it's getting more and more as their numbers increase as their numbers increase and they aren't stopped i will clarify um and uh and but that's not to say there hasn't always been some antagonism, right? The Litvaks didn't like the Hasids, right? If you, you know anything about the 1800s, um, you know that there was a big, big conflict between the Hasids and the Litvaks. Yeah. And the, the Litvaks that the, thought the Hasids were, were Goyim practically because they were dancing and singing and being happy. And you're not allowed to do that, okay? As far as they were concerned. That, by the way, tells you a lot about their version of things that they got mad when people were happy um and so uh <laughs> but but that has changed by the way now there is overlap in, in the Haredi world in a in a way that there wasn't before uh, though they definitely have their own little fiefdoms and they each follow their own Rebbe and and the <clears throat> Uh, the uh, one calls the rabbis rabbi and the other calls them Admor. and each one you know they don't even all refer to their leaders in the same titles um but they it's definitely a them as as the as a group of ultra religious versus the secular and they would lump us conservative jews as secular okay um, go ahead, Maxine. Uh, to me, it's almost, it seems like bullying. You know, like, especially when, if you read Rabbi Plotkin's blog, and, um, and, and to me, a, a, a people that bully do it out of an insecurity. And it's almost like, what are they afraid of from, the rest of the world that they that they feel that they have to be so antagonistic. Do you understand so, what I'm saying? So it's interesting because most of the time when somebody bullies, I would agree with you. What they are doing is not, they don't consider it, it's not bullying. They are trying to purge the world of sinners. Mm -hmm. It's not the same. It's more like it's more like the Salem witch trials than bullying. Oh geez. It's, it's, yeah. You are evil and you can't do that. And I am not evil. And I have the authority to tell you that you are evil because I'm pious and you're not. And it's not the same thing as a bully. It's, a, it's an ideological thing and it's very different. Um, in practical terms, they're equally mean, but the, the, mindset, the process going on. Yeah. Okay. So I saw, okay, go ahead, Sapir. I mean, on what basis 
are they saying this? And it's like, to me, I once had a discussion or I shouldn't say had a discussion. I once had a, a discussion, somebody started with me and she said, she said to me, are you a good person? And I kind of knew off the bat where that discussion was gonna go. I just knew it. And I, I thought, and I said, yes. She's like, well, do you ever sin? I said, yeah, probably, I'm sure I do, you know? And she said, well, then you're a sinner. I'm like, well, but what about all the good stuff I do? I'm a good person. She's like, no, if you sin, you're a sinner. And we went through, and, and I really had to like nip this in the bud, but basically she's telling me, you know, yeah, you're gonna burn in hell and whatever. And like, on what basis can anybody tell you especially other Jewish people, on what basis can they tell you that they are so pious and you're a sinner and you're gonna burn in hell and they don't want you and you're uh, like, where does it even say in the, in the Bible that anybody has the right to do that? This was a Jewish person? No, she wasn't Jewish. Oh, well, that's, I'm sorry. I thought that's what you said. No, but I'm just saying it sounds like even, oh. it sounds like a very Christian ideology where they tell you you're a sinner, you're going to burn in hell. So if you're talking that now we have Haredi Jews telling us that we're sinners, we're going to burn in hell. It's like we get it from both sides. Correct. And these are our own people telling us what the Christians are saying to us or the Muslims calling okay. us so, infidels. So, so here's the thing. We most, I'm going to assume that most of us on this Zoom call believe that there is something as something called the validity of different viewpoints. Of course. And these folks are not, these folks are not raised in a, in a world in which there is something called the validity of different viewpoints, right? So on the, on the video, that most of us had the opportunity to watch when somebody is suspected of going off the derach, they bring them to a psychiatrist. Yes. And right. the psychiatrist is supposed to tell them that they're mentally ill in order to convince them that they need to get back on the derach. And the woman in, in the interview says she was very lucky because the person that they brought her to said, this is not a psychiatric issue. This is a theological issue. And right. Right. that's yeah. it. I, I can't help you. But that does not help happen to everybody. And they are they are living in a, in a closed society that tells them that they are literally crazy. Mm -hmm. They don't buy in. Now, all of, I mean, to a certain extent, all of us within our own worlds are, are victims of the same thing, that we all have to buy into a particular worldview um, in one way or another, the Western worldview or whatever you wanna call it, but it's even more locked in in their communities. And they don't, they don't go to their rabbi and say, the rabbi, does, they, they don't say, rabbi, um, there's no cheese that's uh, got kosher certification in the grocery store and I can't afford meat. What should I do? The rabbi might not necessarily say buy the non of Yisrael cheese because you shouldn't starve. Instead, the rabbi is going to say, tell your wife to go get a second job so that she can pay for the food mm. on the table or go to, go to the, um, you know, the food bank down the street because you can't break the rule. And um, that's a very, very different, mm -hmm. very different worldview. And if you don't like the food example, um, you can use something even, even, you know, they're not going to, their rabbi is not ever going to say, break the rule. your choices. You can do this <laughs> or you can do this. Their, rab, that, their rabbi is going to say, this is the way it's done. And if you mm -hmm. don't do it the way that I'm telling you, you are doing it the wrong way. And, and, and that's a very, very big difference. By the way, there happens to be for some people in the world um, that happens to be a much better way of operating than having to make choices all the time. So right. on the one hand, 
we can say that it's a closed society and it's 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 so oppressive this and oppressive that. But I happen to know plenty of people whose children have chosen to become Orthodox because it is in many ways much easier than right. being an observant conservative Jew who has to think about every choice that you make. Mm -hmm. Because if yeah. you're leading an Orthodox lifestyle, you know exactly what you're supposed to do, when you're supposed to do it, and how you're supposed to do it, down to what hand you use to wipe your tuchas and how you tie your shoes. Mm -hmm. And if you even have ties on your shoes, because as we, I, I don't know if you know this, but some of them don't even wear shoelaces. They won't tie shoes. They don't have laces. So it's a um, mm. very different oh. kind of perspective on life. Okay, Barbara, I saw your hand. No, uh, and then I was. Andy, and then it looks like he wants to say okay, something. Good. Sid, you look like you really want to say something. What do you want to say, Sid? Oh, I, I think it was our. Oh. It's been a long time. I forgot. You forgot? <laughs> I was just thinking in terms of what goes on. Oh, oh. overall. Oh, wait, wait, I'm sorry. Hold on. Now two of you are talking at the same time. Okay. Art, Art can you both started talking at the same time? Um, okay. Is it Sid? Yes. Yes. Then he goes first. He's older than I am. Okay, go ahead, Sid. I'm there, sorry. they live with tradition. The big thing is to take the tradition, accept it from your parents, and pass it on to your friends and your family and your and your children. But they take the tradition and turn it into law. And there is a big distinction mm -hmm. in, in whether we're talking about law or tradition. Mm -hmm. And uh, with, with, in the conservative world or in the reform world, it's, it's different because we either accept traditions or, or don't. In their case, they just make law of it and, uh, and it's done. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent point. And the, the problem with what they do is they pretend, right? I don't know if any of you have ever seen this, but you know, you can get something illustrated that's supposed to look like biblical times and they're dressed in strimals. I've seen it. Right? They pretend that the way they are living is the way that our people have always lived. Mm -hmm. Even though um, mm -hmm. our ancestors didn't have electricity and time timers for their lights in the desert. Right. But, okay, Art, go ahead. The opinion of uh, uh, Group A in the Haredi movement about Group B, also in the Haredi movement, but Take following a, a different set of rules. Right. Does anybody have an idea? So I actually, so, so I, I read a whole huge chunk of, from this series called Understanding Haredi Society um, and, and from the Jerusalem Post. And there are groups now that are getting along better with one another. But then there are groups that are um, that still are, of course, outcasts. The Satmars are very on the edge, and then even more on the edge than the Satmars, of course, is Naturi Karta. And there's also this group called Ada Haredit and Pelagiri Shalmi. And these are all much, much more um, stringent um, in their in their um behaviors you know one of those groups like um is the one where the women on their wedding night they they shave their heads okay and um and and so it's uh there's a, there's a conference within the groups but if they had to band together against the the secular they band together against the secular I will say that in Israel, there was a lot of anti-Haredi sentiment that was pre-existing um, COVID-19. It mm. pre-existed COVID-19 because of the resentment that many of the men try and get out of military service, and so do 
um, and and so do the women, um, and that caused resentment within the Israeli community because it's a part of Israeli society that you're supposed to serve in the, mm -hmm. in the uh, military. You said before that they don't believe in the existence of Israel until the time of that, the that's, that's a few of the sects. Well, how do they justify participating in the Knesset? They don't. They, they don't. don't. They no, don't. the settlers are different. The, the, they, they don't. Settlers are different. They are not Haredim. This, this, uh, oh, oh, you said settlers? Right. Okay. They are not Haredim. Oh, the no, we know that. They're just ortho, very orthodox people. They're not. And they go to the army. Black hats. Those are mostly modern, or, modern orthodox. Modern, and they go to the army. Zionists, mm -hmm. and they go to the army. I'm talking about the Satmars and the Notori Karta people. Um, but what happened is that the pre existing ambivalence between the two groups. Un Fortunately, was extremely amplified during COVID-19. Mm -hmm. There were um, huge swaths of the Haredi world that did not follow um, COVID-19 protocols. By the way, that was both in Israel and in the United States. Yeah. Yeah. Um, many of them uh, frown on lots of things from within modernity and um, and secular authority. And so the rules that were put on Israeli society, um, such as uh, no large gatherings. Well, how could they not gather when it was their custom, their tradition to go and sit at the table of their Rebbe or their rabbi or their Admor whatever they call them, mm -hmm. each Shabbos afternoon for hours at a time. And hundreds of people all gathered in one space. Rabbi, that's, Rabbi, they're, yes. studying to, they're studying constantly. They're studying uh, together. And together. They, and they did not want to, to stop doing that. Mm -hmm. And they didn't follow the guidelines of weddings. <clears throat> and they didn't follow the guidelines for this mm -hmm. and that. And when everybody else in Israel was getting vaccinated, many of the groups um, resisted vaccination at, a, at a, a higher percentage of vaccine resistance than other people. Um, I don't know what their reason for vaccine resistance was, but in Israel where they had one of the highest um, vaccination rates in the world, it caused some resentment, I'm just gonna say. Yeah. And here in the United States too, there are, um, there have been instances of Haredi groups in the Northeast that um, have not followed all of the same uh, guidances and rules and also created um, some issues. I'm, I'm trying to be vague, but I'm just going to say issues. And polio, and polio has. Nasal has polio. Okay. 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 One of the things that I have a problem with, because I do believe in Kuala Yisrael and my people are my people, but there seems to be a disconnect with people who are so extreme that the, the observance of the letter of the law um, takes such preeminence and they forget that the purpose of all halacha is to, um, to better relationships between um, human beings, especially with the Jewish people. I mean, the temple, second temple was destroyed because of baseless hatred, sinat chinam. And so it doesn't make sense to me for them to stone people who are writing on Shabbat or as recently happened in, in the egalitarian part of the wall when they were having the name Mitzvot and these teenage Haredi boys went and they and were girls. disrupted and, oh, and, and girls too? I don't girls think. Too. Girls too, there. yeah. Apparently. And then they were ripping the pages out of the Sidorim and one guy was blowing his nose, others were ripping it apart. To me, I mean, 
whatever the position, there is a disconnect between halakha and what the whole purpose of halakha is supposed to be, to have mm-hmm. a, 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 to improve relations with, between people and between yourself and God and to, you know, in, to perfect your own midot, to, to. Oh, so, but, but you're mixing things up, okay? Yeah. So, so you, so from your perspective, the whole point is to improve relations between yourself and other people, yourself and God, and improve your midot. For many of, of these communities, the purpose of existence is to do what Hashem tells you to do. Period. Period. And that doesn't necessarily mean improving your uh, relationship with other people. Because if somebody else is doing something wrong, they will say, Hashem tells me my job is to rebuke you. Right? That's that's It tells us in the Torah, you're supposed to rebuke if mm-hmm. somebody doing the wrong thing and so we are coming at it from our our perspective and and it's horrific from our perspective their behavior it's 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 embarrassing i mean nobody by the way used this word embarrassing yet um sometimes we watch these things because it's embarrassing to us just when we see when we see them and we're trying to figure out who are these people that embarrass us. And they embarrass us because of whatever it is that they're doing that embarrasses us. I, I, don't, I don't know. I find them fascinating. Like I find the Amish fascinating because it's such a very different lifestyle than me. I find it fascinating uh, that, um, you know, in, in a, in a, in a, in a society where the women are more educated and more out there in the world, right. it's still the men who are studying all day long who are treated like kings and the women are treated mm, not as good. I'm just not going to say <laughs> not treated, but I'm just going to say not as good. Okay. And so it's, it's a fascinating thing for me. And it's a fascinating choice for me when, when people choose to be part of that, but it it goes back to what I said before having answers is very important to people in life. We live in a crazy world that is hard to navigate and to believe that you always have the answer to every situation has got to be really nice for some people. I mean, we're talking a society that that um, that it is uh, so certain of everything that they know that they feel no shame in blowing their nose into a ripped. To a ripped sidur with Hashem's name on it, and they will say, and they did say in the in the example that um, that was used before, that it's not a real sidur because it's a sidur used by goyim, you know, and it has and English in. Us. And mm-hmm. so, it's very fascinating. <clears throat> Go ahead, Sapir. So I I wanted to just say to to Mindy. You know, we as conservative Jews or maybe even Orthodox, probably I heard it, you know, growing up, you know, how the Beit HaMikdash was destroyed because of Sinat Chinam. But I'll bet you they don't believe that. I'll bet you they don't believe that that's why the Beit HaMikdash was destroyed. I don't even know what they even think about that, you know, as far as whatever. And the other thing is in the picture uh, and, and in the story that Mindy was referring to, there was a photo of, you know, a religious man, a young man giving the finger to the photographer, you know, taking the picture. And I'm thinking, is there gonna be a time in his life that he is gonna see that and say, what was I thinking or not? You no. know, that, you know what? Yeah, because unless he, unless he changes, because, you know, I don't know. I mean, yeah, and you know what? It is, a lot of Jews do a lot of embarrassing things. You know, we have Harvey Weinstein, we have Bernie Madoff. And it's like, every time I see a story about like, some doctor that's caught doing something or something. And it's like, I don't want to see a Jewish name mm-hmm. there. I'm, right. I'm hoping to God that it's not a Jewish name. Like, right. You know, Ep- it's, 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 it's not, good. yeah. It's not enough that people hate us. Now we give them even more reason to hate us. And it's like, you know, when, and I just, 
see like this this antagonism as you're saying um as just and like you said embarrassing it's like we can't even how is there ever going to be peace in this world if we can't even have peace among ourselves well so so this is this raises a very interesting question so the other day i went to the moderns game even though i left early as sid and jack no i did leave the game early because i um but when we were driving back from the Marlins game, there was a, a big sign. I don't know if any of you have driven, driven on the highway coming back from Miami. There's this big sign on the highway that says Mashiach is here. Yes, <laughs> and, we, saw we saw it. it. Yeah. Saw it. Yep. And um, I said, where? And <laughs> where? If, like, where? If you actually uh, there, there. <laughs> closely at the sign and I actually I actually did I don't know let me see if I can find it um you took a picture of it no 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 oh, I, I was driving I was driving I almost, so I couldn't I asked I almost asked my um uh husband to turn around so I could get a picture but I did not um, it's Rabbi Schneerson on there Rabbi Schneerson was on that picture. here is here I'm going to try and click oh hold on I said, if he's here, he's not doing a good job. <laughs> yeah. So, I'm, okay. Now, okay. I got that. How, share screen. Oh, the host disabled the participants. Alana, are you there? Can you can you enable participants to share? I just made you a co-host, so you should be able to share. Okay. Can you, so so can you, if you there look. There we go. So if you look at this sign, oh. it says, here, just add in goodness and long live the Rebbe yeah. Messiah forever. Okay. Who is Hula uh, generation? Do you know who that is? So when I too fast to see he who uh, or to see the words below. So as crazy as this sign is here. I, 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 I think there's a lot to learn. Just add in goodness and kindness. Okay. That well, it's, it's, cer it's certainly not the same as the billboard of Woody Allen, that's for sure. Right. <laughs> it's, it's that I would, I actually prefer the, the, the sign with the Rebbe as Mashiach. That's more believable than and Woody, Woody Allen. Allen in a get up looking like a Hasidic Jew. That I find more upsetting than the Mashiach is here sign. Yeah. That's just me personally. Mm -hmm. I don't like Woody Allen. I think he's, I, I got to keep my mouth shut because Yom Kippur's coming yeah. up, but he's not my favorite <laughs> Jewish. I, agree. I, don't, I, don't, I don't believe that Chabad believes that any, any more that, that Rabbi Schneerson was the uh, Mashiach. No. I think they've changed their mind. I think there's a division within Chabad. There was a segment that does or and did and does. And then the mainstream Chabad, it's so funny. How many, even within a, you know, the Chabad movement, with, there are so many divisions even within a movement. Right. So always, that's, that's exactly why I'm showing the picture. Because two things. There, we lump all Chabad together, but the mm -hmm. Chabad mix know that within Chabad, there are three different kinds of Chabadniks. There mm -hmm. are there are the real Chabadniks, the real Lubavitchers who believe the Rebbe was the Mashiach. Then there are the real Lubavitchers who <laughs> do not believe that he was the Mashiach. And then there are the non-Lubavitchers who daven at Chabad, mm -hmm. but don't go along with all of the rest of it. Mm -hmm. But from the outside looking in, all we see when we're driving around Coral Springs and Margate and Tamarack and all these places is Chabad's popping up everywhere like mushrooms, okay? Mm -hmm. Like they're popping mm -hmm. up everywhere, okay? So, <clears throat> but they are um, not all the same. They are not all the same, but, but they do have something to teach. And that is that within their movement they love one another despite mm -hmm. their fears. and the rebbe wants everybody to be good and kind 
And if the rest of the Haredi world could could get to that point where all they goodness and kindness, the world would be much better place than it currently is. Barbara, what were you going to say? You had your hand up and then Shavy. No, I just move around a lot. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, so I was going to make a statement. So we know that the Chabad movement welcomes everybody. Anybody could come in, you know, and they don't ask questions and you're a member and you can have a bar mitzvah and blah, blah, blah. The Haredi community does not welcome people outsiders in or do they? Oh, God, no. No, they don't want they don't want anybody. And you have to be born you, into the you, you have to be born well, you, in there, right? You can you can come in, but you're going to have to. You're going to have to follow all of their rules and you're going to have to prove your yichas and you're going to. And if you don't, first of all, if if you. So I said earlier, there was this group called New Haredim. And the New Haredim are people who became ultra re religious, but they are not part of any of the groups because nobody will marry them. Right. Because so they're like Balchuba Haredi. You're in one of those groups, you have to have somebody vouch for you that you're a suitable partner when right. you get matched. And if you don't have anybody to vouch for you who's going to marry you and if you don't have anybody to marry you if you're a guy how are you going to study in a cola all day because you have no wife to provide so, for you and if you're a woman and you don't have a husband who's going to make you the mother of six children right okay they can't go to where they can't they can't go to the sperm bank and become single moms like like in the non-orthodox world mm -hmm. they do that and they'll be probably killed not honor killed but <laughs> Pretty much. Okay. So they won't accept, so they don't accept anybody who's a Balchuva. That's not good enough um, unless they somehow find favor and get their way in somehow. Someone vouches for them. So, right. so basically, we're saying that the Haredi are not, they, they are so close knit. And maybe that's why they'll always continue to stand out and be different because they will never let anybody in and they will never change. Except that they, they might marry from a different Haredi sect if the other person is willing to switch, switch, but, but they are continuing to grow despite their insularity because they have a lot, a lot of, of job and baby, right? If you have eight babies at a time, not at a time. <laughs> in a life in America. <laughs> okay, if you have eight <laughs> like per family um, ver versus, you know, two or three or even four families or babies in the family sorry which one is going to grow faster right yeah. it's just it's just a numbers game and and that's there's very little that we can we can do about it on the other hand there are always baale chuva becoming new haredim and new orthodox that there are as that show that we watched there are also people going the other way Right. Because I, even I, when you're in a closed and insular society, um, there are always people who think outside the box. That's the way God created the world. God created all of us differently. I gave a sermon months and months ago in which I talked about family feud and how um, Steve Harvey has a tendency to always mock the individual in the family who thinks differently than everybody else. Cause there's almost always one in mm -hmm. one of the five always mm -hmm. gives answers that are radically different than everybody else. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is because human beings don't all think alike. God didn't wire us all to think alike. And it's, it's, it's important that there are people who think differently. And um, so there is a constant stream of people who are leaving that mm -hmm. world, just like there is a constant stream of people that are going into the into that world. Some of the people who go off the derach um, become secular, but some of them end up in our own shoals. Believe it or not, they end up in our own shoals. They end up in conservative movement rabbinical schools or wherever. Okay, so Dahlia and then Barbara. There was def def definitely a difference uh, in the years. In 1982, I had a teacher's aide in Westchester Day School in and Westchester, um, she came for Muncie. I'm talking about people for Muncie. Mm -hmm. And the only thing she was thinking about is her clothes. Her father was very rich. And 
she had a chatan, a chosen, and she was looking forward for him to go and, you know, study in the Kohel. And, the, and I, you know, me as a, as a teacher, I was appalled. I was trying to talk to her, but uh, not to take, you know, to change her mind, but just to understand where she's coming from. Okay, now I'm switching back to uh, 2000 and uh, about eight years ago, uh, I was an ELL in Boca. And there were people for Muncie there that the parents still live there and they go there to the grandparents, but they are different. Even the teachers, um, the men and the women are different. They have a different look. They have a different uh, outlook. Uh, they are very religious, mm -hmm. but they are different. They really came up in this world. And I don't know, they, they are still very religious and they are still dressed, but they are dressed like, like modern women. And it's, you know, they have a different outlook. And I, I've seen the, the teachers teaching in the classrooms because I was substituting for them. So I know exactly what they were doing. They are not like, you know, I don't know if everybody in Muncie, I know that, uh, you know, they moved from uh, Brooklyn to Muncie, but I don't know if all of them are that modern. And even in unorthodox, the way the husband behaves is not like a real orthodox man. He gave in to the girls. He, you know, I know it's a show, but mm -hmm. some truth in it. And he came with his new girlfriend. I mean, it's different, but I'm going back to my childhood. They were always Hasidim, but we, and I didn't live in Yerushalayim. I lived in Tel Aviv, but I knew there were Hasidim in Nebra and they were in Tel Aviv. And we did not have this animosity, you know, years ago. I mean, Israel was much smaller. I understand that. I think things, and I don't want to be disgusting, but I think things had changed with Kahana when he came to Israel and he started stirring up a lot of things and a lot of American um, Hasidim came to Israel to, to study and a lot of kids from, uh, from America came to study in Israel. And I think there is, there was a difference in the whole atmosphere. I, I'm yeah. not sure, I'm not sure I, I wasn't there, but yeah. there is also another thing. Uh -huh. Another thing I want to talk about bullying. Maxine was talking about bullying. Uh, the kids, uh, you know, the boys are studying, not studying in school. They are, whatever, they're just signing Torah. So lucky they know some, they know how to sp spell their name and they know how to uh, uh, do math because they're all very good in math. But, you know, if you uh, really don't know anything about the world and you don't know anything about other people and you live in a box, and you just see everything black because that's what they are wearing, you know, it gets into your mind and that you are right. They have psychological problems, no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. Well, but I think that in their own world, they, they function fine, I guess. I, I'm, I'm not so sure that they function fine. In their you know, own it's world. Abusive, they were even abusive to each other. Yeah. I don't know. I was going to say that there is, you know, within these families, they are, I, I can tell you that being religious doesn't prevent some of them from becoming alcoholics. Okay. Sure. Some of them from beating yeah. their wives or their children or mm -hmm. sexually abusing their children or um, yeah. stealing, drugs, there's drugs uh, and AIDS. Yeah. Healing or going to prostitutes when their wives are unavailable to them. All of the, da all of the darn damages that can get uh, done to people, those things, they're not spared just because they call themselves religious. The, religi the religiosity covers the way they do their religious rituals. It doesn't right. necessarily 
translate into the ethical behaviors, how they treat one another. And that's, that's I think, something that is um, why I said before that the world would be better if everybody lived like that sign about Mashiach. Just add some goodness and kindness into the world, and then Mashiach can be here. Right. By the way, that's a way that you could interpret that sign. If you don't want to believe that, that he's the Mashiach, uh, you can understand it to mean that Mashiach is here if you only add goodness and kindness. Right. Mm -hmm. If everybody adds goodness and kindness, then they'll be like the Mashiach is here. So I don't know how we want to interpret that sign. Uh -huh. Barbara, did you have your hand up? And then we are, we're... So, uh, I, 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 I did. And um, my, uh, my experience uh, with Haredi is not really... In, in Israel, I mean, I've had some experience every time you visit, you have have experience, but um, my personal experience with Haredi goes back to more than 20 years. When my niece became a Baal Teshuva um, in college and um, and then met um, a Baal Teshuva uh, twin um, and in six weeks they decided to be married. Um, uh, the, tw the other twin married someone who was Orthodox, and so they were all accepted into their community in uh, West Rogers Park in, in Chicago. Um, but it's upsetting to me when they come to visit, uh, and I'm the only, I'm my sister's only other sister, and they come to visit family, and when the eight-year-old says to me, and I, it was his birthday, Ben Sion, number two child. And I wanted to give him a hug and I was not allowed to do that. At eight, they are not allowed to do that anymore. So that, that, was, that was traumatic for me. Um, and um, I, I, don't know, I don't know how these kids are going to exist. Um, they go to school. The school they go to is, is a religious school. They go to camp. The camp they go to is a religious camp. When it's time for them to go to university, I don't know how they're going to exist. I really don't. Um, and so um, I wish them a lot of luck, um, but it, it, it's a problem. Right. A big problem. So um, in, the, in the, the video that we watched, um, they were talking about the Beis Yaakov girls and they learn secular subjects in at Beis Yaakov. And nowadays, the, the American law is such that they're supposed to all be getting some basic uh, education in um, minimal uh, reading, writing, and mathematics. Mm -hmm. um, some of the schools are trying to not follow the rules. And there have been court cases in New York um, over this fight, um, and some of the kids that that whereas some of the girls used to get sent to regular colleges like a Stern College, um, now they're going to to much more strictly um, very orthodox colleges, and so the freedom and exposure to other ideas that they used to maybe get um, be the same. Is, is not gonna is not gonna necessarily be there anymore, but they will find a way. They somehow figure out, despite this tremendous effort to keep the sexes apart, they still manage to have all those babies. They figure it out, um, mm -hmm. and uh, they <laughs> seem to have. Uh, Many of them seem happy within their own communities, and many of them are not happy within their own communities, just like in general existence. There mm -hmm. are people who are happy, and there are people who are not. There are people who are content with their lot, and there are people who are not content with their lot. I have days when I just um, don't understand at all how anybody could want to live in that world, and then I have days where I go, you know, I could see how it might be appealing. Sure. Um, and... Uh, I know that I will continue to remain fascinated with them because they are other, yet something that if were it not for the fact that, you know, I got put into this Jewish body in the Jewish family that I did, I could have easily been born into a different Jewish family in a Har Haredi world. Sure. And, um, That's scary. And, and what? <laughs> Isn't that scary? Isn't that scary? And well, it is, I mean, it is scary, and it's it's, it's, 
can imagine, right? Because I've always been a little bit of a rebel. They would have had to send me to a psychiatrist. Okay, right? And 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 um, so it would have been very interesting. Uh, it, I don't don't take that as what I want to try next time. Okay, um, so uh, so it. But I know that I'll remain fascinated, just like I still remain fascinated with the Amish. And I still remain fascinated with various groups that are just simultaneously just like us and yet totally different. Mm -hmm. The main thing is that while they may not consider us or some of them may not consider us their brethren, Who cares? I try very hard to maintain um, a feeling of uh, Jewish connection to what to all of them even if uh they don't want me and i do it because i know now that should the day ever come when the world turns against the jews um mm. they're all going to be lumped together yeah and it whether they like it or not we are going to all be lumped together and so mm -hmm. i'm not going to turn my back on them and hopefully um we don't have to ever get to that point where it will matter. Well, but maybe we'll be saved because they'll say they're not Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> what are you worried about? They're not Jewish. Well, that's, yeah. that's, who knows? Uh, um, that's terrible. I know. Seen last word. I, I just have a question right. of, of a term you used. You said some people are called rabbis and some people are called Adwar. Uh, Admore. No. Admore. Adonainu, Morenu, Rabbeinu. Our, our master, our teacher, our rabbi. Okay. 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 Dahlia. The bottom line is that most of Israel is not Haredim. Most of the yes. people that are- Yes, they have too many kids. Well, maybe in numbers, but people, mm -hmm. you know, they are uh, Orthodox people, modern Orthodox people that live their lives and I, I was in that family. And I, those are the ones that even ignore the Haredim. They, you know, they don't even bother with them. Right. We know where they live. We know that uh, you don't uh, drive on Shabbos. You know, I know that years ago, people purposely went and drove through Mea Shearim on Shabbos to annoy mm -hmm. them. They don't do that. Uh, right. and those are the people that really count. And, you know, it's like now in the government in Israel, they have Arabs and they have the Orthodox because, you know, the Haredim. And, but most of the people that are the, the thinking people are not Haredim. They are maybe Orthodox or maybe they are just following, you know. You know, I, uh, when I grew up, there was no conservative or reform, I knew about it, it's in the United States. So mm -hmm. those things don't bother me even now. But the point is that <laughs> the, we have to have one country in the world, a, a Jews, that we follow certain things. Well, so I, 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 I'm gonna cut you off and because we're almost out of time. And I, I agree, the problem is that I began by reading from this article from the Jerusalem Post that 33%, one third of all the people in, of all the Jews in Jerusalem are Haredim. At the pace that they're growing in another 20 years, they're gonna mm -hmm. be the majority. What is all of Jerusalem gonna be like if the majority of the Jews in Jerusalem are Haredim? All of Jerusalem will become Mea Sharim. What will that mean for the Jews of the world? What will that mean for the mm -hmm. um, di for the for Israel re uh, political relationships outside of um, yeah. out outside with other countries? Where mm -hmm. it, it's you know right now they are a curiosity. And we need to, to be obsessed with them, not just because they're a curiosity, but because they are going to outnumber us mm -hmm. if we don't 
suddenly start having more babies. Most of us are past that. If we don't convince all of our children to have eight kids each, many of our children are past that, right? And, um, and if we don't start converting large people to large numbers of people to our form of Judaism and everything is gonna look very different. I, I wonder all the time what it's gonna look like when I'm on the other side watching my great grandchildren because it's not gonna be the same kind of Jewish world as it is today. Right. Jane, you really are the last, last one, okay? Well, this may be a tongue in cheek, but maybe not so, so unrealistic. Okay, so if we don't want that to happen, I know a group that's very successful in growing their numbers and getting people from other areas. Maybe Chabad needs to have a new target and maybe Chabad using their methods that have been so successful need to go to the Haredi and uh, get them into their group. That would maybe. be- I, Maybe, but it could, work, it could hurt, that's for sure. But Rabbi, we were for worried sure. about, may I? You have to be the very last thing, because I- Okay, we <laughs> were worried we about the Arabs that are multiplying also. And as of now, there are many of them, but we're still stronger than them. So maybe Hashem has this way of taking care of us. I, ho I hope so, I hope so. From your mouth, literally, to Hashem's ear. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you much you for Thank you, Rabbi. It's very interesting. <laughs>